Alexandra Palace was first opened in 1873 as the People's Palace, but within weeks of it opening, it was destroyed by fire. It was later rebuilt and eventually became the birthplace of British television when the BBC started broadcasting from the site in 1936. Nowadays, it makes a great venue for all kinds of events, one of which started here back in 1977, the Classic Car Show. The London International Classic Car Show allows clubs and private enthusiasts, as well as trade stands, to come together under one spectacular roof. This year sees exhibits from around 50 car clubs featuring some of the top classic motors from around the UK. From Jaguars to Lamborghinis, Triumphs to Fiat's, all taking pride of place in this magnificent building. Well, as expected, there's loads of club stands on show here at the London International Classic Car Show. One of them is a Jaguar, Jaguar Enthusiast here. Club, isn't it? it? And Alan Bennett, you're one of the people I'm, who run it? I'm, in, I'm the chairman of the London and Middlesex region. OK, tell us about Jaguars. What's so special about a Jaguar? Well, I, I think it's just the love of the car. From the early days, I, in 1948, I went to the first launch of the XK120. I'm old enough to have been there and loved Jaguar from then on when I was at school. Well, I think Jaguar because it's British, it's a traditional British car, uh, raced famously at Le Mans, of course, early on. When they, and the, the, the connection with Jaguar and Le Mans, I find is totally fascinating. I go there each year to Le Mans. Those Jaguars don't run, but it's still a great race. And the love of Jaguar, the skill, the workmanship, the engineering. Yeah, I think it's fair to say, despite those glory days, mm. that Jaguars, you know, it kind of went through a bad patch, didn't it, really? Oh, it did During do, the yeah. 70s? That's right, during the 70s. Well, that's when why, British, why do you think that was, though? It was then, I believe, a nationalised company, I think, with British Leyland took it over. Uh, and it went downhill, then all of a sudden, so John Egan came along, picked up the reins, and said, we're going to get back to winning cars and having a good production car that people can buy and like and will carry on buying. But Alan, what's the benefit of being in a car club? Well, the big benefit we, I find from, uh, from the club is you've got experts at the end of a phone call. Experts with the trimming, the engineering, the painting, the welding. There's always someone at the end of the phone I can ring up and say, can you help me? And they've always say yes. If they don't know, they know a man that does. People ring up me and say, Alan, can I help me? If I can, what do you want to do? I'll put them onto someone that knows what they're doing, painting or engineering. Uh, and the, the camaraderie between us all is great. We all help each other out. And it's a one common interest. There's nothing like it, I don't think. I'm, I'm brainwashed. <laughs> you have a passion for the car, that's I good. I do indeed, yes. Well, David, this is your Jaguar E-Type. Indeed, and yes. Quite a big engine you've got under there. What sort of yes. size engine have you it's got? It's 4.2 litre. That's fast. Which is, uh, well, I wouldn't say about fast. It's a four-speed gearbox in there. And, of course, don't forget, these cars were good for about 130 or so, that sort of mile an hour. Uh, as you know, all Jaguars, they call them 120s because they did 120 miles an hour or 140s because they did 140. And then, of course, a 150 is 150. I don't know, a lot of people know that sort of thing. But E-types were good for about 130, something like that. The E-type is a real icon of Jaguar, isn't it, really? Absolutely, oh, yes. what, yeah. What, what is so appealing about the E-type, though, to people? Well, it used to attract the birds, didn't it? I mean, that was the main thing. I don't know whether there was enough room in it for things that you might think you might get up to. But on the other hand, uh, the, the girls did like the unit and it was generally a bit of a sort of flash car from that point of view. But what are they like to drive? It's a big bulky car. Well, yes. It's heavy, there's no power steering. No, that's right. This is, this is quite right. In fact, if you don't have the tyre pressures about right, I don't say it's critical, but it's, if you have it harder, it steers more comfortably. That's the whole point. So clearly, yeah. if I was looking to buy a classic car, it sounds like I should be looking to buy one of these. What yes. can I expect to pay for an average E-Type Jag? Um, if you're talking about a roadster, an open one, yeah. then you're talking about 30,000 30, or 30 odd thousand. Yes. yes. To sum up then, would you say it's a good investment for the future? Oh yes, without a doubt. There's just about something on show for all motoring enthusiasts, from Rileys to Lamborghinis. Millionaire Ferruccio Lamborghini made a small fortune building tractors from surplus vehicles left over by the Allied forces. A Ferrari owner himself, Ferruccio confronted Enzo Ferrari in person about a problem with his car. Enzo told him to get lost, so Ferruccio decided to show him how to build GT cars, and so the Lamborghini was born. 
David, tell us a bit about Lamborghinis. Why are they so appealing to people? I think the reason Lamborghinis are so popular is because Lamborghinis hold you here endlessly. And they don't let go. Design-wise, as, as with everything in Italia, it's more a case of having something that, this looks good, let's put it on the car then. So they did. Usually, whether it worked properly or not, Ferruccio Lamborghini was a rebel, self-made man. He wanted to build the cars he wanted. If I was looking to buy one of these then, mm. what can I expect to pay for, for this car? A Uraco in usable condition, and not a three litre Uraco like this, can be had for between 10 and 15 thousand pounds. You're 19? Yep. yep. And you've just bought yourself a Lamborghini? Yes, I bought myself a Lamborghini Uraco P250S in red. It's a bit expensive for a 19 year old? Mm. Well, not really. I've always wanted one. I've wanted one for 12, 13 years. So. Why a Lamborghini? Um, well, I really loved Ferraris first off, um, then saw a Jeremy Clarkson video, saw a Lamborghini Countach, and uh, just fell in love with the Countach and just wanted one ever since. Now, Leslie, what's this we got on our arm here? Isn't this taking it all a bit too far? Uh, yeah, well, this is for uh, my Uraka when I got it. Uh, I just got made redundant from work about two months after I got it, so I just thought, right, I've done this because if I ever sell it, I have a memory of it. I mean, you can have pictures and movies and stuff like that, but this is permanent. And videos and pictures, you can get it lost or whatever, but this is permanent. This will always be with you, no matter what. Is this what's known as literally having it in the blood? Yes, this, this is. This is definitely having it in the blood. Owning a classic can have positive effects on the family. In some cases, it can even bring them closer together. Since my son's been about sort of eight or nine he's we've shared a lot of interest in the, the Lamborghinis together uh, he's taught me things uh, that I wouldn't know and we've just generally got this built up this relationship in the Lamborghinis and uh, I've just got this passion and I love the vibrant colors the the whole range of different colors that you can get from the sort of bright oranges to the uh, sort of blacks. Uh, there's a whole rainbow of colours and I think that is what has, has done it for me. Over the years there's been various organisations producing the show. Dish has been produced by Andrew Greenwood. Andrew was one of the original show producers back in the early 80s. Andrew, you run the event here. The event opened back in 1977. That's quite a while ago, isn't it? Um, the first one here was um, 30 years ago this year. Um, it's had a, a broken history, and as far as obviously the venue uh, burnt down in, the, uh, in 1980, so it was closed for seven or eight years. But it's been running more or less continuously since 1988 to the present day. How important is this event in the classic car calendar? It's the season opener, it's the one that everybody looks forward to because it's like the cuckoo, it's the sign that summer's coming and it's time to get your car out. So would you say this is a place for the family to come to? Absolutely, there's no question. You'll see families walking around and, and having a good time. The thing is that, that the family has got to be interested in cars. There's no hiding from the fact that it is a car show for car enthusiasts, whether young or old, male or female. What kind of things can people expect to see when they come to the London International Classic Car Show? It's a club-based event, so you'll see over 50 classic car clubs. We pull out the, uh, the best cars and put them in the showstopper section. Those are the private, the private cars. Then you've got cars for sale. We have dealers here. They always sell, sell cars, some beautiful examples here. There's an auction here, so you can come along and buy a bargain at the auction. Then you've got the trade stands. Some of the biggest companies in the classic car movement will be here. But equally, some of the smallest companies, just one-man bands doing specialist parts for, I don't know, Triumph 2000s of 1948, will be here with on a stall selling things to the general public. So there's a wide range of things both to see and to buy. Owning a classic isn't all about exotic big engine motors. It's often a personal statement. So, uh, Dave, this is a bit cosy, isn't it? What is it? This is a 1959 Brighton built BMW Isetta bubble car. Now, if I was taking out a young girl for the first time, I can't think of a better car for getting more intimate. Indeed, indeed. And you get, you get noticed as well. What's the appeal of these? This car appealed to 
I assume guys that, that were courting at the time um, didn't want to take their girlfriends out in the in the rain, you know, getting wet and things like that. They could they could sort of, as you say, be more intimate in the car. Um, it, it appealed to people who wanted sort of value for money motoring, as it were. Um, these cars were launched during the Suez crisis, had very good running costs. Now, and you've done a lot of work on this car. Tell us what you've done to it. Uh, basically, since I've had it, it's been completely uh, restored. Basically, it was stripped down to nothing. Uh, these, these cars were built on a chassis. Uh, the body comes off. It's all sheet metal construction for the body. Basically, stripped down to nothing. Started again. What's your passion about this car? That's a very good question, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose it's, it's, it's different. It's individual. Um, at the time, I was looking for a fairly small car because I didn't have a lot of room to, to work on where I was living. Um, and it, it just struck me one day to get a, get a bubble car. And, and I did, <laughs> and I'm hooked. <laughs> and what sort of um, what size lump have we got in the back here? We've got a 300cc single cylinder air cooled engine, four stroke. So a lawnmower engine, basically. It's basically a lawnmower engine, yes, yes. But a very well built lawnmower engine because they're basically a BMW engine. But I guess that's the good thing about owning a classic, isn't it? It doesn't have to be a, a Rolls Royce or a Lamborghini no. or an MG. No. A classic is. You know what, what what appeals to you, isn't it? It's what you like and what yes. it represents to you. Is yes. that right? That's very true. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I, w I don't think I'd part with it. Um, there's, there's a lot of effort gone into it, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of me in this car. I think you know, it's it's good fun. It's good fun for appeal, head turning. Um, if you want to get attention, buy one of these. Have some fun. Since 1977, classic cars have been on show here at Alexandra Palace. Thousands travel from all over the country to visit the show and maybe even pick up a bargain classic themselves. Paul here, you run a business where you actually sell classic cars. Yeah. People come here to see these nice, shining, gleaming classics. Yeah. Is it a bit of an impulse buy for them? Well, often there's a reason they buy a particular car. Maybe when they were young, they're, they're, one of their parents had a, a, a car like this or whatever, and the years go by and they think, I want to go back to that and have that same feel of driving the, the, the same looking car, etc. So there's often a very good reason why somebody wants a particular model and, and perhaps a particular colour and specification. So, okay. We've got a Daimler here. Yes, we have. To yeah. me, it looks like a Jaguar. Yep. Explain to us the difference between a Daimler and a Jaguar. Well, basically, they both come on the same production line, side by side. This could have been a, a Jaguar starting and, and, um, or a Daimler. Um, it's taken the Daimler flag, and the Daimler is always a higher specification than the Jaguar and always more expensive to buy initially. Can, can you sort of split the two buyers, the Jaguar buyer and the Daimler buyer? Oh, yes, very much so. The Jaguar buyer often is a very sporty person, performance-minded, um, and, and likes that uh, leaping Jaguar feel. And then the Daimler person is often perhaps a bit quieter, maybe um, a, a bit more restrained person, uh, maybe more professional, maybe a, um, a doctor or solicitor or something. If I fancied something a little bit smaller, yes. what would I be looking at? What else have you got well, for me? Well, we'd take you over to a Mini, which is probably the other ah. extreme, a total opposite car in, in, in every respect, really. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the, the getting towards the end of the production run of the Mini, and it's a Mini Cooper, which is, the, uh, again, a nice specification yep. car. Yep. Uh, this particular car is, is quite would be quite difficult to repeat in the sense that it's only done eight and a half thousand miles from new which right. so that which, is low mileage which is it? very low and it hasn't been used through the winters so it's not been out in the salt uh, this one has a nice feel about it you can tell it's been cared for it's not scratched dented anywhere so the person that's owned it or the three ladies have been extremely careful with it Let, let's talk about um, price now and what mm. we what can you expect to spend on these two cars let's yes. say I was looking at the, the Daimler yes what yes. can I expect to pay for that well that particular one is, is exceptional value um, it's four and a half thousand pounds so you've got an awful lot of motor that's a lot car. of car for your money awful lot of motor car exactly so yeah I, I'm, I'll be surprised if we don't sell that one there. onto the mini then. onto the mini which will yes. fit nicely into my garage I yes. must admit yeah yeah what are we looking at paying for something like this um, I think at six and a half thousand that represents excellent value for money and a good investment if it's kept in that condition if the mileage is kept low so if it's not used as an everyday car and it's treasured and maybe taken to shows um, classic car shows etc then that car will, will prove to be undoubtedly a super investment for somebody but it's not just classic cars that people come here to see there's also an auto jumble which attracts visitors from all over Europe in search for that vital part that could help keep their ageing classic on the road. 
There's also dozens of trade stands selling everything and anything to do with cars. You could even pick up some tricks of the trade. This is a barn with a die. The seats are looking a bit tired and faded. We've got a few scuff marks and scratches. A little bit on the rag and you massage this into your seats. Any, any scuffs or scratches or faded edges of leather will come out. It's actually a way of re-dyeing the leather underneath basically. That's enough shopping for now. Time to get back to the classics. Brothers Alan and Richard Jensen's first efforts of building a car came when they put a sporting body onto an old Austin 7 chassis while they were still apprentices during the 1920s. By 1935 the first true Jensen car appeared and the rest as they say is history. David, you're involved with the Jensen Owners Club. That's uh, right. I've been a member of the Owners Club since 1981. Uh, Jensen Owners Club, we now have about 1,400 members, mostly in the UK, but quite a few in Europe and also worldwide. When did these cars really make uh, the impact on the The world? Jensen Interceptor was introduced in 1966. 1972 was probably the peak and the cars were hit because it's a big American V8 by the fuel crisis in 1973. And what, what, what sort of price would these cars be gone for in those days? How much would it have cost? Let's have a look at this blue one, for example, here. This is a traditional image of a, a Jensen that I have. So how much would I have expected to pay for that back in the 70s? 6,000. 6,000 pounds? Yes. That's a long time ago, and that was probably a lot of money, but that it still was doesn't sound a great deal for a car of this nature. Unfortunately, it was more expensive than the equivalent Jaguars more expensive than an E-Type and that's why people thought this was an exclusive motor car. But why did people go for this rather than a Jaguar then? Because it's so easy to drive. It's a lazy American V8, it's an unstressed engine, it'll just poodle along, tuk, tuk, tuk. whereas the Jaguar high revving, high performance engine this thing is an American. They built seven million of these engines. It's nothing exclusive. And it was so easy to run. That's why people would go for this. It was, a, it was known as the Gentleman's Express. It was just such relaxed touring motoring. But these cars were really put on the map, surely, during the, during the 70s in the TV series. Pers the Persuaders, the Persuaders, am I right? yes indeed, you've got a good memory of yeah. that. Its predecessor, the CV8, was in the Baron well before the Persuaders. But this became an icon of the era. This was the, the big luxury motor car, indeed. We said this car back in the 70s would have cost £6,000 to buy. What would it cost now to buy? It depends how much you want to pay for it. Okay, let's say I'm, to that. I'm here, I'm quite naive, but I'm looking for a classic. You're looking for a classic, I can sell you an absolute dog for under 3000 Really? Is that cheap? I can sell you a pretty reasonable, uh, not that I'm a car salesman, I can sell you a pretty reasonable car for 10000 I can sell you a very nice car that you'd be proud of for fifteen. That's the sort of money we're talking about. Now you came in to me and said, it's an expensive car. When you're paying that much money, and this is what you get for it. Do you still think it's an expensive car? I don't, especially when you take in the fun factor. And that's why we're here, and that's why we like these cars, the fun factor. David, this is a pretty unique vehicle. Tell us a bit about it, what is it? Well, this car is the only right-hand drive Citroen Acadian that I know of and it was brought over from France as a new vehicle in 1982 by a dealer down in Brockenhurst in the New Forest. And they converted it uh, by putting in a raising roof and the drop-down rear doors and all the conversion to the inside and also converted it to right-hand drive. It was then owned in the Isle of Wight by an elderly man uh, from 1982 right up until 1999 and then sold briefly to another family in the Isle of Wight and I bought it in 1999 and have used it ever since. It's not a show vehicle, uh, it's not in show condition, it's in using condition and I use it for camping, uh, not as much as I'd like to, perhaps more when I retire, but I certainly use it for camping more than I do for showing. Although wherever I go, of course, people stop and want to talk about it, which is fine by me because I'll talk about it for hours on end. And they seem to have made great use of the space. I mean, looking around, I can see there's lots of different compartments. Tell us a bit about some of the space they've used and how, how they've utilised it, really. It has a lot of internal storage space because the lockers 
uh, there have plenty of room. There are more above the uh, driver's door and the passenger door. You've got hanging space there. You've got a little, a little sink in there. And storage for cutlery in there. Uh, also, when you're stopped, of course, there's lots of shelf all the way around the top of the vehicle there. It has its own cooker. It has a mains hookup, if you're on a campsite with mains. Um, and it carries its gas bottle in a locker under the shelf there, which is accessible from inside by a, a flat. It has the same suspension, of course, as all the, the two, two CVs. Uh, and therefore, it has interconnected suspension front and rear. Uh, very soft suspension, and so it will go anywhere. It's got good ground it's clearance, so it'll go over rough roads, and it is very comfortable to drive. It is unique. It's the only one of its kind that exists. Uh, it's a, a brilliant conversion, and I love it. Um, it. It is just one of those things that attracts attention wherever it goes because it is different, and it's different from all the other camper vans and uh, Roma homes and things that you see because it is just so odd. The DeLorean was actually sold in Ireland and then obviously went bankrupt. After that, people got to know about it from the Back to the Future film in 1985. After 1985, the cars just rocketed in sales and everybody wanted them. So what is so special about them? It's, it's a car that attracts people and it's just a lovable enjoyment thing to go to go for a ride in. You see normal cars going down the road like a Vauxhall or a Cavalier, you know, you see Ford go down the drive and you go down the high street and people go, oh, it's just a normal car. You drive down the high street with a DeLorean and people will stop and go, absolutely amazing. The actual engine is a PV, it's part Renault, part Volvo. It's a three litre uh, injection car. So it, the biggest problem downfall was the DeLorean was the actual engine because there weren't enough power in the engine. But for an enthusiast like me, when you own a classic car, it's not the speed, it's the, pa it's the passion of the actual drive of the vehicle. If you've got a classic car, you need to keep it a classic car and then people will admire you for that. If you start putting turbo kits on it and things like that, it, it just loses the interest of the car. I like my car as it is. It pulls enough, it pulls enough attraction as it, at the moment. They made about 6,000. There's 6,000 actually on the road. We're on the count of about 120 actual running vehicles. There's still quite a lot in America, but the problem is now we're getting a lot of people in England who want the car. There's such much of a demand, they're starting to import it from America. The TVR was one of the last true British sports cars. In spring 2006, the Blackpool factory was closed by its Russian owner, Nikolai Smolensky. But in early 2007, he bought it back from the administrators that's welcome news to the TVR fans who are dedicated to keeping the cars on the road. Justin, the TVR is quite an exotic British car. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about it. What's the appeal? The appeal is, well, it's a hand-built British sports car. You know, it's the passion that the guys at the factory put into it. And that kind of feeds through to the guys that buy them. It's not sort of your run-of-the-mill like a Porsche everyday car, but it's the actual thrill of something different. And, you know, the passion, the actual engine noise and the note that most people seem to like when they buy it and it's just totally different styling to sort of any other sports car out there. Tell us a bit about the history of TVR, how it came about and where it's at now. Oh, it was basically started by an engineer in Blackpool called Trevor Wilkinson and uh, that's where the initials uh, TVR come from, they're, they're sort of taken from his first name Trevor. So and they started off in Blackpool very making a little sports car for himself first of all and then other people asked him to make cars and that's kind of how it evolved gradually what, what, what makes this different to a Lotus or something like that? Um, I suppose a Lotus is all about handling, but a TVR, yeah, handling's part of the package. It's the noise, it's the thrill of going fast, you know, and people looking at your car is also, you don't have to go fast if you don't want to, and people just look at it and admire it for what it is. You know, it's, well, it is one of the last British sports car manufacturers. And what are they like to drive? It's not like your everyday car. You know you've been driving a TVR at the end of the day when you've been driving it. It's a workout, but it's a thrill to have driven it. You know, this is a proper car. The controls are a bit heavy, but it's not an everyday car for most people. Yeah. It's just, you know, go out on the weekends or in the evening, have a bit of fun, get the top down, have a blast, get the adrenaline pumping. Are they good, reliable cars? Like any car, you get good ones, you get bad ones. Strangely enough, the more they're used, the better they are, nine times out of 10. 
How would you sell a TVR to me? I would say it's individual, British built sports car, good reliability if well maintained, and the guys can look after most of them themselves. You know, if you fancy having a tinker, you can look after it and maintain it yourself. It's a great car. Justin, the car behind you is rather special. Tell us a bit about it. It's a TVR Cigaris from 2005. Uh, it's one of the last production models to come out of Blackpool factory. And this particular one is one of the two press demonstrator cars that came out in 2005 to launch the car and was featured in all the magazines and uh, Top Gear programs at the time. And as you can see, it's in a stunning color. It's really striking. And its nickname is Mr. Orange. The other press demonstrator was a blue car, and that was Mr. Blue. So are, are we hoping to see more TVRs back on the road in the future? Yeah, we are, definitely. We're hoping the, you know, that production's going to pick up again, start again, even if it's abroad. And the club caters for all TVRs, doesn't matter where they're made. And it's all about the passion of the mark and the excitement you get from driving one. Sum up the appeal of owning a TVR then, Justin. It's unique, it's a handmade sports car, it's got individualistic styling, and the sound is like nothing else you've ever heard when you put your foot down. For many, the London International Classic Car Show is a sign that those long winter nights are behind us and spring is just around the corner. It means that another year of classic car indulgence lies ahead. And it now looks like there could even be another show to close the season. We've long felt that there ought to be a focus on the close of the season other than in, in Birmingham at the NEC. And uh, Autoglim approached us with a view to bring the final of their national concourse competition um, when we contacted the clubs for this show to bring it back, we said, would you also like to come again in October? And 90% of them said yes, we would. Whether you're a petrol head or not, the London International Classic Car Show is a great day out for all the family. Just remember to bring plenty of cash with you 